Hi right, guys, this is Little Brother by Cory Doctorow, Chapter 5, Part 2. So far, Marcus has been talking with uh, his friends, Hulu and Van. They just got sprung from the facility, and they, he had the revelation that terrorists love terror. They don't hate bridges or airplanes. And uh, his big revelation, though, is that they can't tell anybody about the terrible things that happen. Marcus sent to them, especially not their parents. He has another plan for getting some kind of revenge, and uh, he says, give me one day. And I will let you know. And they, the last thing that's happened is they turned down Market Street. Market Street is the big diagonal street running uh, across San Francisco, and they see that the biggest street in this huge famous uh, city is covered with nondescript 18 wheelers. They look just like the government bucks that took them from the prison and, uh, where they were released. Each one had three steel steps leading down from the back and they buzzed with activity. The soldiers, people in suits and cops went in and out of them. The suits wore little badges on their lapels and the soldiers scanned them as they went in and out. Wireless authorization badges. As we walked past one, I got a look at it and saw the familiar logo, Department of Homeland Security. The soldier saw me staring and stared back, glaring at me. I got the message and moved on. I peeled away from the gang at Van Ness. We clung to each other and cried and promised to call them. The walk back to Potrero Hill was an easy route and a hard route. The latter, or has an easy route and a hard route, the latter taking you over some of the steepest hills in the city the kind of thing that you see car crashes on in action movies, with cars catching air as they soar over the zenith. I always take the hard way home. It's all residential streets and the old Victorian houses they call the painted ladies for their gaudy, elaborate paint jobs, and front gardens with scented flowers and tall grasses. House cats stare at you from hedges, and there are hardly any homes. It was so quiet on those streets that it made me wish I'd taken the other route through the mission which is, ruckus is probably the right word for it, loud and vibrant. Lots of rowdy drunks and angry crackheads and unconscious junkies, and also lots of families with strollers, old ladies gossiping on stoops, lowriders with boom cars going thomp, 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 thomp down the streets. There were hipsters and mopey emo art students, and even a couple of old school punk rockers. Uh, old guys with pot bellies bulging out beneath their dead Kennedy shirts. Also, uh, drag queens, angry gang kids, graffiti artists, and bewildered gentrifiers. That means people that move into a poor neighborhood and turn it into a rich neighborhood. So everybody that already lived there has to move in. Trying not to get killed while their real estate investments mature. I went up Goat Hill and walked past Goat Hill Pizza, which made me think of the jail I'd been held in. Remember they give him Goat Hill Pizza for, uh, for his meal in jail? You could have a lot worse food in jail. Uh, and I had to sit down on the bench out in front of the restaurant until my shakes passed. Then I noticed the truck up the hill from me, a nondescript 18-wheeler with three metal steps coming down from the back end. I got up and got moving. I felt eyes watching me from all directions. I hurried the rest of the way home. I didn't look at the painted ladies or the gardens or the house cats. I kept my eyes both my parents' cars were in the driveway, even though it was the middle of the day. Of course, Dad works in the East Bay, so he'd be stuck at home while they worked on the bridge. Mom, well, who knew why Mom was home? They were home for me. Even before I'd finished unlocking the door, it had been jerked out of my hand, and flung wide. They were both of my parents looking gray and haggard, bug-eyed, and staring at me. We stood there in frozen tableau for a moment. And, st uh, and then they both rushed forward and dragged me into the house, nearly tripping me up. They were both talking so loud and so fast, all I could hear was a wordless, roaring barble. And they both hugged me and cried, and I cried too. And we just stood there like that in a little foyer, or fo some people say foyer, crying and making almost words. until We ran out of steam and went into the kitchen. I did what I always did when I came home. Got myself a glass of water from the filter in the fridge and dug a couple cookies out of the biscuit barrel that mom's sister had sent us from England. Marcus's mom is British. 
The normalcy of this made my heart stop hammering, my heart catching up with my brain, and soon we were all sitting at the table. Where have you been? They both said, more or less in unison. I had given this some thought on the way home. I got trapped in Oakland. I was there with some friends doing a project. We were all quarantined. For five days? Yeah, I said, yeah. It was really bad. I'd read about the quarantines in the Chronicle, and I cribbed shamelessly from the quotes I published. Yeah, everyone who got caught in the cloud, they thought they had been attacked with some kind of superbug, and they packed us into shipping containers with the docklands, like sardines. It got really hot and sticky. Not much food either. Christ, it's balling up on the table. Dad teaches in Berkeley three days a week, working with a few grad students in the library science program. The rest of the time, he consults for clients in the city and down the peninsula. Thirdwave.com's better doing various things with archives. He's a mild-mannered librarian by profession. But he'd been a real radical in the 60s, and wrestled a little in high school. I'd seen him get crazy angry now and again. I'd even made him that angry now and again. And he could seriously lose it, and he was hulking out. He once threw a swing set from Ikea across my granddad's whole lawn when it fell apart for the 50th time. Barbarians, Mom said. She'd been living in America since she was a teenager, but she still comes over all British when she encounters American cops, health care, airport security, or homelessness. Then the word is barbarians, and her accent comes back strong. We'd been to London twice to see her family, and I can't say as it felt any more civilized than San Francisco, just more cramped. But they let us go. They ferried us over today. I was improvising now. Are you hurt? Mom said. Hungry? Sleepy? Yeah, a little of all that. Also, dopey, doc, sneezy, and bashful. We had a family tradition of seven dwarfs jokes. Or I say Marcus is maybe not the big genius. Uh, anyway, we had a family tradition of seven dwarfs jokes. They both smiled a little, but with their eyes all wet. I felt really bad for them. They must have been out of their minds with worry. Can you imagine what it would be like for your family if you didn't show up for five days? I was glad for a chance to change the subject. I totally love to eat. I'll order a pizza from Goat Hill, Dad said. Uh, no, not that, I said. They both looked at me like I'd sprouted antenna. I normally have a thing about Goat Hill pizza. As in, I can normally eat it like a goldfish eats his gold food, gobbling, until either it runs out or I pop. I tried to smile. I just don't feel like pizza, I said lamely. Can you remember the last time you didn't feel like pizza? Me neither. Uh, let's order some curry, okay? Thank heaven that San Francisco is takeout central, and this is true. Every kind of delicious food is available all day, every day in San Francisco. One of the nice things about living, it's not, not all of it's nice. I didn't like it. One of the nice things about it. Every kind of good food. Mom went to the drawer of takeout menus, more normalcy, feeling like a drink of water on a dry sore throat, and riffled through them. We spent a couple of distracting minutes going through the menu from the halal Pakistani place in Valencia. Halal food is food that uh, that uh, Muslim people they can eat uh, follow through with their uh, dietary guidelines. I settled on a mixed tandoori grill and creamed spinach with farmer's cheese. Stuff is good. If you can ever have palak paneer, have some palak paneer. I'll focus on the book, sorry. Uh, a salted mango lassi, much better than it sounds, and little fried pastries. Once the food was ordered, and quite the question started again. They'd heard from Van, Hulu's, and Daryl's families, of course, and had tried to report us missing. The police were taking names, but there were so many displaced persons that they weren't going to open the files and, or, on anyone unless they were still missing after seven days. Meanwhile, millions of Have You Seen Them sites had popped up on the net. A couple of the sites were old MySpace clones that had run out of money and saw a new lease on life from all the attention. After all, some venture capitalists had missing family in the Bay Area. Maybe, if they were recovered, the site would attract some new investment. I grabbed Dad's laptop and looked through them. They were plastered with advertising, of course, and pictures of missing people, mostly grad photos, Wedding pictures and that sort of thing. It was pretty ghoulish. Seeing pictures of all those people and they had died terribly. I found my pick and saw that it was linked to Vans, Holus, and Daryl's. There was a little form for marking people found 
and another one for writing up notes about other missing people. I filled in the fields for me and Holu and Van and left Daryl Lane. We forgot Daryl, Dad said. He didn't like Daryl much. Once he'd figured out that a couple inches were missing out of one of the bottles in his liquor cabinet, and to my enduring shame, I blamed it. One day, he blamed himself. In truth, of course, it had been both of us just fooling around, trying out vodka and cokes during an all-night gaming session. He wasn't with us, I said. A lie. Just it. Was that for a minute? Oh my God, my mom said. She squeezed her hands together. We just assumed when you came home that you'd all been together. No, I said, the lie growing. No, he wasn't supposed to. He was supposed to meet with us, but he, we never met up. He's probably just stuck over in Berkeley. He was going to take the bar over. Mom made a whimpering sound. Dad shook his head and closed his eyes. Don't you know about the Bart? I shook my head. I could see where this was going. I felt like the ground was rushing up to me. They blew it up, Dad said. The bastards blew it up at the same time as the bridge. The Bart trained the subway. It's pretty cool. It's uh, underground in most of San Francisco. Then it goes underneath the bay in a tunnel. The whole train goes under the bay, then you go back out. So if they blew up the Bart tunnel, uh, not only would the explosion have killed people, but a bunch of water would have rushed into the bay and drowned them. It's a terrible, terrible way to die. And it goes, it runs parallel to the Bay Bridge across the bay. That hadn't been on the front page of the Chronicle, but then a Bart blowout under the water wouldn't be nearly as picturesque as images of the bridge hanging in tatters and pieces over the bay. The Bart tunnel from the Embarcadero in San Francisco to the West Oakland station was submerged. I went back to Dad's computer and surfed the headlines. No one was sure, but the body count was in the thousands. Between the cars that plummeted 191 feet to the sea and the people drowned in the trains, the deaths were mounting. One reporter claims to have interviewed an identity counterfeiter who'd helped dozens of people walk away from their old lives by simply vanishing after the attack, getting new ID made up and slipping away from bad marriages, bad deaths, bad lives. Dad actually got tears in his eyes, and Mom was openly crying. They each hugged me again, patting me with their hands as if to assure themselves that I was really there. They kept telling me they loved me. I told them I loved them too. We had a weepy dinner, and Mom and Dad each had a couple glasses of wine, which was a lot for them. I told them that I was getting sleepy, which was true, and mooched up to my room. I wasn't going to bed, though. I needed to get online and find out what was going on. I needed to talk to Holu and Vanessa. I needed to get working on finding them. I crept up to my room and opened the door. I hadn't seen my old bed in what felt like a thousand years. How's that for a simile, right? I lay down on it and reached over my bedstand to grab my laptop. I must have not plugged it in all the way. The electrical adapter needed to be jiggled just right, so it had slowly discharged while I was away. I plugged it back and gave it a minute or two to charge up before trying to power it up again. I used the time to get undressed for my clothes in the trash. I never wanted to see those clothes again. I put on a clean pair of boxers and a fresh t-shirt. The flesh, fresh laundered clothes straight out of my drawers felt so familiar and comfortable, like being hugged by my parents. I powered up my laptop and punched a bunch of pillows into the place behind me at the top of the bed. I scooched back opened my computer's lid and settled it onto my thighs. It was still booting, and man, those icons creeping across the screen looked good. It came all the way up, and then it started giving me more low power warnings. I checked the power cable again and wiggled it, and they went away. The power jet was really flaking out. In fact, it was so bad that I couldn't actually get anything done. Every time I took my hand off the power cable, it lost contact, and the computer started to complain about its battery. I took a closer look at it. Something suspicious.